Oh, good morning, and, um, and firstly, thank you to the, uh, the hundred local land service for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I'll be fairly uh, brief, I won't dilly dally, but, uh, but basically, in my presentation, I'm going to uh, review some of the drought, the, the dry season, not drought, um, livestock benefit options which are available. I'm going to reinforce some of the key messages, like uh, yeah, lots of people in this room have, like me, been through lots of dry seasons, droughts, all sorts of things before. So there is no magic silver bullets that I can offer today. Yeah, so as I said, I'm just going to review some of the draft and other advice on many different options that are available. Read more some of those key messages about um, animal nutrition and, uh, and feeding options. As I said, nothing has really changed in relation to the animal and the food. Feed options, there's no silver bullets, so, and I'm going to bore you with lots of detail going over lot, uh, stuff in detail. Uh, I want to just touch quickly a little bit on, on, on just um, the importance of, um, of feed budgeting. I want to also touch, importantly, I believe, on looking at the financial implications um, in regard to possible reduction in, the, uh, in income and rising cost of production in these tight seasons. Uh, and as well as talking about that, Jim's going to talk about looking after the welfare of the animals. I'm just going to touch on uh, looking after your welfare because I think that's really important. So, quick um, comment on my background. As Kirsten said, I um, I worked for the Deep Guy for many years, and I left the Deep Guy in 2010. I had a long, very rewarding career in Deep Guy. I'm very fortunate, uh, fortunate to have that. And I, like lots of you here, have been through these um, these sort of seasonal conditions many times. And I. Um, Embarrassed his 34 career, 34 year career of DPI. My kids shout at me and I tell them that. They say, Why did you work for the same organisation for 34 years? Um, but towards the end of that career, I did do some work with you know, Austin Common to meet Miles of Australia and big cooperative research centre all over southern Australia. And in that work, I saw the amazing value to be had by working with big cattle producers in small groups, uh, sharing knowledge and experience. And I make that point there because it's relevant to what I'm going to touch on a bit later. And that's the model that I base my little one man band consulting business on. Okay, so to get to, uh, to the point, I guess the options available, um, and these are ever, forever changing, and people have touched on them already before that um, seasonal conditions mark change by, by the week. Uh, they might not change totally, but signals come out by the week, a bit of rain, you know, the market responds, and all sorts of things. But by and large, they can be grouped into feed. Sell or adjust, um, and now I'm just going to look at the, look at uh, some of the important aspects that relate to those three broad groupings. Seeing adjustment is up first of all. I'm going to touch on it. <coughs> Good, secure, reasonable price adjustment close to home is everyone's dream, isn't it? But it's not always easy to find, uh, of course, and it gets harder to find uh, as the season gets tighter. Uh, and it's probably already taken up. I don't know about this area here, but I certainly know in the area that I come from, uh, it's taken up very early on because I'm trying to find a distant 400 skis. So uh, I, I know exactly how, how it works. And, and, it's, and, there's a very, and there's some evidence to back this statement up. The further you go away from home, the greater the likelihood of problems are uh, developing. You know, the local burglars uh, get word that there's some cattle there that are not being looked over closely. All sorts of things can arise, and the further away from home those cattle are, the greater the likelihood of that sort of, those sort of problems developing. So um, ideally, it's the closer to home uh, and the more security that's in place, the better. Um, biosecurity issues become extremely important, particularly in relation to cattle that are going to come home to the home property, breeding cattle. Uh, disease issues and all sorts of things. And I listened to, um, to Jim's presentation in Scone last week, and Jim's going to touch on that, so I will pursue that no further again. Uh, and, and of course, the gist of rates tend to go up when it becomes more sought after, uh, which certainly was the case. Maybe it might be as um, been alluded to in, in the first presentation. And can I say, I hope you get your rain this weekend because boy, it's great when it comes. Because where I come from, we've had just Unbelievable March type rain in October, which everyone's pitching themselves. So I hope you people are doing in the same situation after this next rain event that comes through here. Um, so uh, good luck. 
Uh, so, uh, but certainly, uh, obviously, you know, just rates go up as uh, as the uh, as the demand comes up. And it depends on how how long the haul of freight is. I can assure you, running bit double cattle on bit double trucks is uh, is not cheap. So if you've got to go uh, go a long way, it's uh, it, it certainly adds up. But most important, and I um, and I stress this uh, that if you are contemplating or if you have to take up some adjustment. Get some sort of documentation in writing. And I'm not talking about going to your solicitor and get a drafted up document that's 20 pages long. Um, uh, a single one page with some dot points about who's responsible for what. Uh, things like you know, secure, uh, security, about insurance, about notification in writing before you, before you terminate the agreement. Just can be one page, signed by both parties. Might not stand up in any court of law. But it's certainly a great thing to have in your in the bottom of your drawer to refer to if there is some issue down the track. Um, I I certainly use it all the time, and as I said, it's nothing complicated. <coughs> type or get some of the type and make dot points on a piece of paper. Uh, absolutely recommend. Okay, the sell option. Again, there's this is well. Uh, documented in the draft strategies and um, publications at the local land service, the DPI local land service are available. So I'm not going to touch on it. Um, you know, and I know there's lots of documents over there, and Kirsten will probably is, uh, is the first point of call, call for um, to, to expand on any of these points. Sell low priority stock first, you've heard it all before. You know, a cast raised cows, it might come on for a, because it was good good last couple of years, might have snuck it, held a few extra a few old cows back. Because they were still carving, they were still sound, uh, just to keep the numbers up. But when it gets a bit tight, you, know, you might pick a great time to um, to take a, take a, another age group of cows out of the herd um, you know, and, and the, the dry cattle and stuff so like This one is very pertinent. I don't know so much about here, um, but for, across the big area of the, of the northwest and the, the upper hundred through the northwest New England. Uh, where cattle are relying on oat crops for um, over the winter. Uh, those oat crops cut out really quickly and early, uh, and lots of people were forced into the marketplace with, uh, with cattle that probably, you know, 20 or 30 kilos less weight in, in those previous years. But they had to go. Uh, tough decision to make at the time, but the market was still um, pretty strong that then, and it was, and the pain wasn't so hard when, uh, when, when the market was strong. Was, uh, okay. Um, the one thing across the industry that we've got today that we didn't have in, in years gone by when we were trying to manage drought situations is that the, uh, the feedlot industry has such a dominance across the board that there's uh, basically always a market at a price for feed and cattle. Uh, so that, it's a great option. I know a lot of people would try to protect, some people don't like selling feed to steers because they like to make sure every steer goes off as a prime MSA steer or a, um, or a you know, grass fed bullock or something like that. But it's a great default option if you run out of food. Um, and there's lots of um, different weight slots and, and things in categories in those food So it's a great option that we've got available to us to reduce stocking rates fairly quickly if we have to. Um, selling early, I know it's very easy to early, the early is only a relative term uh, because when, how do you make that prediction? What do you know is going to happen next week? Um, but Selling before that flood of cattle, which often happens when seasonal conditions deteriorate across a big area. Now we haven't. Now we're, I'm not pushing pet butts here, but uh, they're sort of the, the. We all remember what happened three years ago when when the, when it got really serious across a huge area in Eastern Australia, and there was literally a tsunami of cattle on the market very quickly, and you couldn't get a, a feed a feedlot to give you a price. You couldn't get an abattoir to give you a price. You couldn't get a truck to cut, transport cattle. You know, six or eight weeks because there were just so many cattle on the market. So if you can, uh, you have your cattle um, ready to go and the market is, uh, is okay, it's a great time uh, to take it. Because I'm a great believer, and the previous speaker said, you know, lots of old saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm very much a believer in that. We, it's, it's good to look back and be guided by what happened in the past, but don't live there. Make a decision and look forward. And, uh, and sometimes uh, we have to do that, uh, I guess. To avoid all these actions are uh, being preemptive, so we don't finish up in situations where we're looking at welfare cases, which is what you can talk about. And, um, and importantly, uh, I guess everybody here, I would assume, runs you know 
a pasture-based system, so it's all about looking after those pastures um, and, uh, and ensuring that we don't damage our pastures because that's our reserve for making money when, when seasonal conditions improve. Um, and, and also, if you're, if you're in a situation where you do employ labour, uh, reducing numbers uh, can, be, can lessen the amount of uh, labour that's required to keep the business going through those tough times. Three. And as I said, I'm not going to go into in-depth here in relation to talking about feeding options. There's, there's, the DPI have got a very uh, a, a big publication called Managing in Drought, um, and I'll touch it in a minute where, where, where we can access some of this um, online, or I'm sure we can access in hard copy through the through the uh, resource people available to you through the, uh, through your local uh, land service. But I'm going to just touch on a couple of broad principles here. We, we really do, before we launch too far into this stuff, to do some planning. And I know, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I, and I did work for the DPI for a long, long time, so I, I've, I've been asked all these questions many times over that, and observed lots of things. And a lot of these really critically important decisions that can have massive implications down the track, whether it's for the animal, whether it's for your financial situation, or whether it's for you personally, are made without a lot of planning. And I guess, uh, because it's human nature, we tend to hang off and hang off and then go, we'll get over here one day and go, oh wow, things have really gone pear shape, I'm going to do something. Um, and, uh, and, and sometimes that's probably not the best uh, environment to make such a decision in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between production feeding um, and maintenance feeding. So production feeding basically means um, providing whatever's needed to make up for the for the for the shortfall. So if your pastures are just down to you know grazed down to a thousand kilograms of dry matter per hectare and the, and the cows and calves, which I assume most people here would be spring calving, so the cows and calves now, those cows, they're under a massive demand for energy. And if people if people who have been pro-grazed very simply simplistically, they remember the histogram of pro-grazed where the feed requirement for your cows if they're in that situation now is double. Well, they were about a month ago before they got. So they want double the food, and if you've got really grazed their pastures, um, something is going to give. The cow gives a condition score, uh, but then if she's given up one condition score and there's still no food there, she won't come calf. Or she's less likely to go and calf. So if we're, if we're going to maintain our production in the future, we've got to make up that deficiency. Uh, Versus maintenance feeding, where we might go, okay, we'll just make sure we keep these cows in a good, strong condition, so we're not, so we're not going to be seen to be you know, neglecting the welfare of them, and something gives, and it might be getting that calf for next year, which will have the impact on your um, on your um, cash flow and, uh, and long-term carryout implications. implications. So it means that you're basically maintaining the inventory, you may you may in a status quo, but of course it comes at a uh, there's a disadvantage associated with it that is costly because you must be buying lots of food to make up that deficiency to ensure those cows stay in fat score three plus and go back and calf within your specified period, whether that's a 12 week joining or whatever. Um, you, uh, it, it could be quite expensive to buy in that feed, and feed can become difficult to source, particularly in um, if dry conditions are. Um, a prevalent over a big area of um, big area. We all know the consequences or the situations uh, uh, from the past. With maintenance feeding, might, as I said, you might just go, okay, I'm going to make sure that I don't get reported to the RSPCA and Jim come knocking on my door uh, from a welfare point of view because we all know that Jim will sort us out. Uh, so we, uh, we need to make, make sure that we keep everything ticking along, but we're not like Go, okay, well, we'll leave the bulls out, we'll, we'll have compromise, we'll leave the bulls out for an extra month or two months or whatever. Um, we just keep the cows going along okay. That's the difference. Now, there's, there's disadvantages there also that it can still be costly, but you might also be affecting your productivity, your retirement in relation to the next season and things like that. Supplementary feeding versus full feeding. Again, I would dare to say that um, most people in this room, if they are feeding, they are probably feeding in the supplementary phase as opposed to full hand feeding. Um, and I would hope 
that we're not pushed into that full hand feeding situation. That this rain event comes um, and what that's forecasted, and you'll and you'll be able to um, stay out of a situation where your paddocks are basically like this, whatever, and you're forced into a full hand hand feeding situation because there are lots of uh, management issues and cost issues associated with that. Supplementary feeding is basically, I guess, about identifying you might have a um, uh, have a component of the animal's requirements and missing. And the classic one being coastal is that we um, we go come out of winter in a normal season with uh, some carryover dry feed, the tropical pasture, native type pasture, um, and the and the cows calve and they're lacking in protein. So you know we um, we we identify that and protein as a limiting issue and we select a, a, a product that will supply that. And I had the actual benefit of working with the Grafton and research team many years ago when the DBI had funded research stations and did research work, applied research work, done a Grafton work on the background work that was done by David Hennessy uh, on the use of high quality protein mules uh, named cottonseed mule uh, as, a, as a supplement for coastal breeding cows with, with outstanding results. Uh, so it's important to get all those things right, get the frequency of feeding right, the timing, not wait till the cows have lost uh, that critical condition score to start, start before that. Um, but it's also really important to measure and monitor to make sure that you're feeding the right amount to the right animals in a timely fashion. So, and that applies uh, to whether you're using, you know, broken needles or pellets, lip blocks, uh, molasses-based products, grain, pellets, uh, white cotton seed, hay, which you're commonly used and I'll assume of people in this room Depending on that, know you personally. Depending where you would probably, there would be probably people here who've asked to put their hands up. We're probably covering most of those. And it's easy. Some of those are easier than others. It's easy to buy lick blocks. Just back to the union at the produce store and get a pallet of blocks, put on a dry red paddock, and throw them out, uh, and hope for the best. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on on molasses-based products in the, later on. Um, and some of the others is you know grain and grain pellets uh, come with sort of potential. Uh, acidosis type problems, uh, white cotton seed, you know, ideally you need to use infrastructure to handle that because you divide it in bulk and, and get it out as opposed to shoveling it. Uh, and hay is uh, kind of costly. So full hand feeding, as I said, I'm not going to touch, spend a lot of time on this, we can talk about a whole day of how to, how to go about a hand feeding operation, a full feeding operation, but I'm not going to. There's pamphlets I noticed out there, um, uh, on which actually do address just this topic in itself. But a few things I need to talk about some critical things to think about, to remember if you are forced there, to we'll get the cabinet management groups. I, I saw lots of people in my career at DBI, and you go out to visit them because they're, they're impressed that you've got everything in pattern. Cows, dry cows, cows with calves on them, cows are last year's when it's following them around, the steers, everything. All, in, all, in, all together, and they're putting out some food. And that's just a, just a waste, not a waste of food, but it's just a, a, a very ineffective means of getting of, of putting out food that you're spending good money for. So getting the cattle in different management groups goes without saying, but not always um, happens. And confined stock um, to what probably they call these days confinement uh, paddocks, so that you minimise the damage to the pasture across the board. Uh, in, uh, as an investment in recovery, uh, fast recovery, and less than the amount of energy that's used up by cows wandering all over the place uh, and burning up energy in the process of doing it. Um, continually check the health of the animals, um, and Jim will touch a bit more on, I think, on some of this later, but uh, it's uh, grain, when you start feeding with high levels of grain, there's, uh, there's lots of potential problems come along with it. Not to say that you can't do it, it's been done many times in the past and very successfully. Again, it's important to keep, to keep track of what's happening, to make sure the right animals are getting the right food uh, and that you're getting value for the money you're spending because none of these things are true. So it's largely, I guess, but in our situation here, in, in most of the cases, as I said, often it's about filling a, a protein deficiency because you might still be, we will tend to be managing with uh, carryover winter feed uh, in the spring, probably hopefully not quite this long into the spring, but um, so it's, it's about protein there, but 
when we do run out of food, it's basically about energy. So it's energy, energy, energy. So more energy is basically what we're looking for. And the energy-rich products that we normally fall back to are the grain uh, and grain-based products. Um, but when feeding, feeding in, in larger quantities, in the absence of um, roughage, acidosis, of grain poisoning to use them can occur. Uh, and it's really critical um, in that situation to uh, to include roughage in that in that in that in that mix. Um, but hay, of course, is uh, I don't know what it's like around here, and um, but certainly as soon as there's a hint that uh, seasonal conditions are sort of getting tight, the price hay goes up, and the quality of hay that the quality of product that's trotted out on the market probably goes down. So there's a price going up and quality going down. Certainly where I come from. There's lots of product being sold as hay, which possibly in another season might be sold as mulch. Or used to, uh, or used, um, to make compost. Uh, but it, it, it goes out as, as under the label hay. So, uh, just a couple of tick off little quick dot points here. Uh, see if I can go into detail about getting cattle starter in the grain. Um, it's about slowly introducing them to the diet so that the cattle get a chance to, um, to uh, adapt. Uh, in the rumen, uh, and that normally comes with including some roughage in the um, in the uh, in the ration or in the in the, in the supplement they put out. And it's really critically important to monitor animals more closely. And as I said, I think I heard you talk about scone and parts of this uh, in a, in a little bit more detail. Dry licks and supplement, I don't know, I suspect the same down here than the last probably five to ten years, dry licks. Uh, have made a major resurgent. They are really widely used where I come from. Um, and they come in all forms, uh, shapes and forms, and they've all got uh, mostly a uh, brochure that goes with them that's going to fix it. And, um, and, uh, and, it's a, and I appreciate where you're sitting there today is how do you pick the one that's going to do, um, do what you want uh, in your situation. Their primary role, basically, if we go back to the basics about a dry lick that you probably go back to the supplementary feeding option, you've identified a deficiency in the diet of the animals currently, um, and, you, and you want something that will fix that. And that deficiency, that deficiency largely for us is about the lack of nitrogen in the system to keep the rumen working properly and keep the passage time of the, of the low, low quality food up as it passes through the animal. So they're basically about stimulating intake. Um, and, and if we're going to stimulate intake by feeding a dry lick um, or, or supplement, we've got to have something there for them. And so it goes about saying, if we feed them a, a lick product that speeds up the time that the, it passes through the room and the bacteria in the room and the microbes are all working faster and better because they've got a better environment, the animal goes out, I want to eat something. So no putting that on the next one here, past cell product. Uh, because there's nothing there. So they go, it goes hand in hand that we need some low quality roughage, and low quality roughage um, and the lick uh, in a synergistic effect, working in a synergistic effect. And the biggest, one of the other major problems with dry licks as well as choosing the right one, paying, paying for it, is getting the intake right. Because it, it varies from property to property and paying to pack. And the people who have any, had any experience in mixing their own, or know the frustration I'm talking about that you'll make a mix, you'll get it right for this group of cows, and you'll start feeding another group of cows, and might be running a, a paddock up the other end, probably with salt top, probably fractionally different, and, and you've got to go back to square one to add some salt or take salt out of it just to get the UK roll. But there's no putting it out if you're not going to need it, all it's going to do is sit there and wait for the first storm to get wet. Um, uh, sorry. Now we all love to have a paddock of low quality roughage available like that, but I don't have to put a dry lick out uh, with. Um, that's an extreme situation, but uh, I'm just going to drill for just, I promise you, just a couple of minutes on the other one, a couple of, so, uh, this slide out of the old, uh, out of progress, and that's it. Digestibility is a great term, if you understand, because it's, um, it describes basically true terminology, the amount of food that feed that this end uh, in dry matter, how much of it is used for bodily function, and how much 
is passed out the other end in bulk products. So we've got a, a, we, we can talk about a food that's 70% nested digestible edible, for every 10 kilos of edible meats, they utilize it to 7 kilos and uh, 3 kilos is disposed of as waste product. But it's, greater, it's, a greater, it's a greater indicator than that. It's, there's a positive correlation between digestibility uh, and energy level in megajoules per kilogram of dry matter in for crude protein. I say it's a positive correlation. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a hell of a good one. So if you know that the feed is 70% digestible, you know that you're going to utilize a fair bit of it. It's going to have a reasonable a level of energy and a reasonable level of protein. And we focus on, we, we I, when we were doing, when I was with DPI and we were running programs courses, digestibility was the key focus. And there are other, some other things that also go with it. How fast the food that goes in here passes through the system is really important. Goes in, the little microbes in this room and here, which again, we can have a really in-depth discussion going for all day about that, but we're not going to do. How fast they process that 10 kilos and break it down into the seven that that you use and the three that goes out there affects intake, intake of passage time. So what happens if the cow, if the animals, if these are your cows and they're eating 50% digestible food and they're laying under the iron bark trees up on the top of the ridge, laying there very contentedly, you think, well, they're, they're pretty happy, but they could very well be laying there because they're waiting for this to happen in here so they can go and eat some more. So you get a, you know, you, you, you get a, a, a lowering of intake and a suppression of performance. So it's important just to think about that. So why we feed supplements is to endeavour to speed that process up. And this is, I'm going to show you two slides, two bits of data. So this was, this not, so it'll just be a very data limited presentation, not a totally data free presentation. And I won't dwell too much here. This is old work done in 1989, but you know something? The biology of the animals hasn't changed since 1980s. It's still the same. Same as our biology hasn't changed. The animal biology hasn't changed. So it's relevant today. And simply, to what I want to look at here, not so much the numbers, but some trends. This work, this work looked at the role of urea, and urea is just a crude form of putting nitrogen in the root. So the little bugs need nitrogen. This is the crudest form of getting nitrogen in there quick, uh, quick uh, readily available, quick nitrogen is by putting urea in, because that's where it is. It's the same as put out in pat paddocks. It's available instantly, basically, if the moisture is right. So there's an increasing amounts of urea feeding grounds per day. The live, the live weight there, and the live weight change with the version there, and the intake of the low quality hay over here. And the two things that I want you to look at is here, rising urea, there was a urea rising intake and uh, rising level of performance in uh, flyweight weight change per day. Now, it's basically just a linear. Increasing the nitrogen content in the roof of those animals, they're in pens, so it's totally controlled, not so easy when we go and do it in the paddock, I accept that, but the principle is the same, rises. The other piece of data is similar, but it's presented slightly differently, but it's more complex. This was when they used um, urea and bypass protein in a similar experiment. Bypass protein simply means to go back, and I'll, and I'll, I'll promise you we won't go too long. Oh, sorry. Not all protein that goes into that room and is broken down actually in the room in the big fermentation tank itself, the crude. Some of it escapes the. Um, escapes the activity of the little microbes in there but because it's been slightly denatured or something like that. It escapes and it's absorbed from the lower intestines as amino acids. So that's what we call bypass protein or non-degradable rumen protein. And those amino acids are the building blocks of, of, body, of, of body tissue. So it's really, it really works really, particularly in young animals. So it's really desirable to have room, uh, not have protein that we bypasses the rumen. Uh, and again here, the urea achieved a certain level in animal performance, but adding in the bypass protein lifted significantly. 290 grams a day, 600, uh, with similar intake increase in the uh, in the intake. So, what am I? Um, why am I talking about banging on about that? When you go out to try and choose that dry lick supplement, have a clear vision as to why I'm doing this because it's have I got. 
the rough is there, which I want to stimulate. Yeah, how, what, are the, what are the critical things that's going to improve that? It's going to basically going to be the room function, provide nitrogen by the protein there and stimulate the intake of the energy. That's basically what it's about. Excuse me, Bill. Yeah, good. Just outline the price you can pay the pumping package. Just, just building number on what people might say. Oh, most of us do in tropical type pastures. So even at their best, you know, we're 10 to 15 percent. People say to me, say to me as they've got, it must be something to do with the water those cattle up on the table they drink that makes them do so much better than our food here, because our food looks so green, and, uh, and you know, why our cattle you know, do well, but don't do the same well. It's bottom end is basically we're looking at a difference in digestibility, because we've got tropical top grass, and we've got claws and ones there, which is this high. Uh, they've got lots of cellulose lignin in them, which takes a lot more to break down in the room and all that stuff. So, you know, we might have a, a really good tropical type pasture, Peter can comment here. You know, 65, maybe 70% of it's really well met. Whereas a ryegrass pasture is 75% plus. So, and then a frosted tropical type grass coming out of winter could be maybe 50%. You know, I, we, and one of the progress exercises we did in the upper current, we sent a sample of frosted bay heat grass uh, away to the laboratory and in a separate container we sent away a sample of cardboard that, that came from the box that we drank beer out of and they came back much the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's true. Uh, because <laughs> so that's it, yeah. So we're looking at extremes uh, in that situation. That's a good question. High moisture foods. They're great, again, something that's highly, really popular over the last 10 years, uh, uh, probably molasses, uh, liquid molasses based foods. You know, and I'm not here to, to, uh, to cast, to, to bag them at all because they tick off lots of boxes. They're really convenient uh, and easy to use because you don't, a lot of them you don't need any infrastructure, you just need a, phone, a telephone to make a phone call to organize someone to bring the feed on, on site. Uh, so they're really convenient. No infrastructure needed, um, but they come with a, uh, a few potential um, hazards to the to the people if you're not if you're not aware. So it's critical to do some homework. To and the critical piece of information you want to come out of your homework is what's the dry matter content. Dry matter content obviously means take the water out of the product. What's left? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about dry matter. I'll come back to that. Because lots of water is, um, is critical for survival, it's got no nutrient value, nutritional value. Same with us, you know, we're encouraged to drink lots of water, but that's not to, uh, to boost our, uh, our level of nutrient intake, but it's to, it's to uh, improve our, you know, main, maintain our body, good bodily function. So buying water, buying clean stuff, with a lot of water it can be costly exercise. So, it's really important before you buy any food, to do some planning, get some help if you need it from local answer staff or on the web or whatever if you computer savvy, to compare these products on a common basis, whether it's dry matter, or whether if you're buying energy on a mega joule per kilogram of dry matter basis, or kilograms of protein. Now, I'll put on a little, I'll go back, show you the answer. I came on the plane yesterday, so it'll be a very small bottle on the plane. Um, that's, a, that's a molasses based liquid product. How much, uh, what's the dry matter of that product, do you think? On someone, how many, what in percentage terms, what's the dry, what's the dry matter content of that? Here we go. <laughs> no one's going to say, okay? I was really young. I did some homework for this product, and it was 68% dry matter. So 68% of that is dry matter, 32% is water. Now that costs $555 a ton, uh, as is, so the work out with the uh, with the uh, with the dry the cost for dry matter, because I, I decided I don't need it, don't need to buy water, uh, it's a simple uh, formula, it's 555 times 68 multiplied by 100 is nine, $809 a ton. So if I was going to buy that product, the important message is, I'm not actually paying $550 a tonne, I'm paying $809 a tonne for what I'm going to use. Because 
I think you could buy the other 30, if you bought some of that, the other 320 um, kilos of that is still going to cost you 55 cents a kilo. And uh, maybe you could buy the water cheaper somewhere else. So just be aware of that. As I said, I'm not just saying don't use those products, but just do that bit of homework. Absolutely critical. And New South Wales DPI had a developed a feed cost calculator uh, back when Bernie and I worked for the New South Wales DPI, uh, and I'm 99% uh, and I'm 90, 90 sure that it's here on the New South Wales DPI. Yeah, still there, right, Mr. Mark Twain. So here's a great resource to go to. Um, New South Wales DPI, Google up, I found this. So Google up, I just Google New South Wales DPI, I found up. Uh, I found an icon there that said that information and resources, clicked on that, and managing drought, and the resources are listed there. Now, I'm not very computer savvy, and, uh, and, and, uh, but I managed to find a way through. So it's a great resource, and as I said, I'm sure there are good and other local answer stuff that can readily um, help you if you, uh, if you haven't got a computer or you, or you can't work your way through that to access uh, this sort of information. Okay. I could touch on photobudgeting. Um, we tend to think more about photobudgeting when things are good, but it's also still very important when we talk about it in, um, in, dry, in dry seasons. And I'll give you a quick here to discuss some of those techniques. But obviously there are some skills that are required to do it. Sorry, I'm walking now. <laughs> uh, and obviously we need, to be able to, we need to be able to do some basic pasture assessment. And uh, if I had lots, if I had more time, we could talk about who being pro grades and, and whatnot, uh, and have that skill. But it's about assessing how many kilograms to drive out of there. So when people are like myself talking about, you know, a thousand kilos, or twelve hundred, or eight hundred, or three thousand, you know what we're talking about. About a percentage green and a percentage digestible. It's about predicting animal impact. And again, there are tables in the pro grades menu which I still use today. You can go and use great programs like grass feed. Um, which I used to use when I was at the DPI, but I don't have a grass feed now, it's an option on my computer now. It's about knowing what is a reasonable residual pasture to graze your pasture back to before you start the damage. And I think and Peter Wheel is going to talk about pastures later. And then it's about putting that information into a into a simple photo budget. And it can be and I practice a lot of preaching here, I do do some photo things in the process of running my cap. Um, and there's some there might be some like that. Better days than this moment. Okay, so let's talk a bit of a passion of mine and uh, about looking a bit closely, a bit more closely at the business's financial performance as opposed to just how the cattle are going out of the day. Do some basically before you start, test out a range of options and discuss, most importantly, discuss those with other people involved in the business, family business, you know, whether it's husband, wife, children, whatever, and uh, and even your bank, whether it's a you know, rather bank or whoever. Now, this is a real living example, and I just took this out of, um, I get all my, my clients who are in my beef groups to do a cost of production calculation for the business each year, we pull it together in the groups, there's eight groups, and then we, we discuss that those outcomes you know, in a very open, transparent way to help us set directions for where we're going in the future. That's a very snatch, quick snapshot. So this is, and I hope it's probably not, the, the one number, I only ask you to look at one number, so don't worry if you can't see the rest. So we're, the key things to calculate cost of production is knowing the kilograms of beef you produced in the trawl month here. This business produced 200, a bit over 200,000 kilos of beef. That's the bottom line, which was the result of inventory change, plus sales, less purchases. So down here, 200,000 kilos. It costs, $485,000 to run that business for the year, including the allowance we put in for the owner operator. So remember that $485,000 is the only number I want you to remember. Divide those two together, that business's cost of production was $2.18 in that year, for that year, which was 15, 16, 15 no, this is 16, 17, sorry. And um, I also know that that business sold their beef on average in that year for $3.34. So they've got an operating margin, an indicative operating margin, and sort of an even down here, interest that earnings before interest and taxation, uh, of $1.16. That's what's left to pay the 
paying for the things that are not taken into consideration uh, in, the, in the cost we put into that calculation. Now, so, going along pretty good. Dollar sixteen multiplied by 200,000, that's what money is available before interest and taxation after we've paid, us, paid ourselves an owner-operated uh, labor unit. So that's what meets the, the below-the-line expenses, the discretionary expenses. How much money you've got to pay in relation to interest, capital, injections, and those sorts of things. Now what if you had a 15% reduction in the kilograms of beef you produced to cause of a dry season or effect? Then you spent $40,000 on food. And the price of cattle came back to three bucks. And I picked three dollars out of the This is very simple. Cost of production went up to $2.96. And the operation margin went down to zero dollars point four cents. So we wiped out, wiped out the margin. So there's no money to pay the discretionary effect. The bankers probably don't like me classifying interest payments as a discretionary effect expense, but that implies that you know you might be paid if you feel like it or you don't feel like it. They probably don't particularly like that uh, categorisation. But that's all. I'm putting it up as a as an example of a. Do it before hand as opposed to finding down the track, uh, being told that you run out of, you run out of money on your overdraft, you get caught and see the bank. So it's important. Um, and if you're interested in more uh, getting more knowledge and more and skills in relation to this financial management uh, um, scenarios or area, um, I know that the local land service are in the early, early part of planning some um, training work, workshops in this area. So watch, watch the space um, from, uh, from local land service. And I strongly encourage you, really strongly encourage you that I think it's something that I wish I had developed more skills in earlier on in my career as opposed to uh, at the, um, at the end, of, uh, end of my career that I'm uh, rapidly approaching. There you see average figures from uh, four of the groups over uh, for the uh, 16, 16 year, which we're about to update in 16, 17. Now, important. Look after the welfare of the animals, because Jim's going to tell you more about that, but look after your welfare. I'll be quick here. As I said earlier on, I left the DPI with a vision that I was going to do some little consulting work, and I looked for a niche, and I thought working with big car producers, getting them together in groups, which was an affordable way to offer a consulting service to them. Um, it was a model to follow, and that's what we do. And it's a really powerful tool for people to get out, get together, talk about what's going on in their place, share their experience. That you're not the only one that's run out of food, the other crops cut out, you've got to sell the steers, blah blah blah. Whatever. We did that. We did that in the shed the other day. It was one of those groups on the Liverpool Plains. Um, we also had a guy there to talk about drones, so we had a light-hearted session after. But just the power in that group, in that shed, with those people talking about what they're doing, uh, was a great experience. Everybody got a couple of minutes on the soapbox, as I called it, went around, and asked each other questions. Really powerful. And I, uh, and I think it's a great, a great uh, means of, um, of helping um, look after your welfare when things get tough, because you're not the only one, team, you're not the only one doing it tough. And I don't care whether that's a group that meets to play tennis on Tuesday night, or whether the group organised or uh, agency or whether it's a, a, a group architect or so on. I'll leave take our messages. Surround yourself with competent people who can add value to both yourself and your business. Really important. Don't waste time focusing on issues that are not going to make a difference. Sharing knowledge and experience is really powerful, particularly when, uh, when things are a bit tough and you think that you're the only one doing it. Don't be, be distracted by DFOs. And I'm, when I'm a DFO, from my point of view, is a data-free opinion. Uh, and we in the cattle industry are experts at uh, sharing data-free opinions around uh, and always try to make evidence-based decisions. But most importantly, enjoy it. Thank you.